This is a recording with Reverend Timothy To, Ascension number 002007, Real 7. Um, can I get you to describe the church structure? The structure of the church is based on Presbyterian system. That is to say, we have no bishop, nor is it a congregational setup like Baptist. Every church is on the local structure. The Presbyterian system is that we are autonomous, every church by itself, but we are also linked together with one another to form a presbytery. In other words, the churches are more interlinked, not like Baptist churches, they are just completely independent. We are independent, but we are associated in the Presbyterian system so that as the churches grow, then they form into a presbytery. And as it grows further, we may form two presbyteries. And then a synod will be the General Assembly. This is the way of church structure. Local setup, we have got the pastor, the elders, and the deacons. I understand that the synod has already been di res uh, dissolved. 1988, mm -hmm. because of uh, disagreement in the matter of uh, charismatism and separatism on these two counts. What about the Presbytery? So the Synod is dissolved, means the Presbytery is dissolved. Mm -hmm. Actually, we became so big, so we just call it a Synod, mm -hmm. and we did not have separate Presbyteries, but we meet once a year as a synod. Mm -hmm. mm. This you are referring to before 1988, correct? That's right. Okay. What about now? Do the churches... So 1988, the clash came, and because we tried to have reconciliation, but it could not be reconciled. So finally, we dissolved it on the 30th of October, 1988, which now has splintered into four or five groups. And um, everyone is practically on his own. But I have a good, very good uh, rapport and fellowship with my brother's church. And we are the two biggest churches mm -hmm. in the denomination. So that if the two big churches get together, it's worth more than 20 churches of the smaller yeah. ones. You mentioned that he has splintered into four to five groups. Yes. Uh, what different convictioners then do this among these four groups? We are the main group. Life Church, the Mother Church stands by itself. And then my brother's church is in Pandan and Jurong. We don't have any uh, organic connection, but we have a moral, spiritual connection. We consult each other. So that is one group. The Zion group links up with Mount Carmel. And together with Hebron and Herman, you know, they're the mountain churches three or four of them, and um, they are of the persuasion that they would like to fellowship with the new evangelicals and more open, and they also have a soft spot for charismatism. Mm -hmm. So this is one group. And then there are five or six churches that are together, and uh, with Philip Heng, Bok Fi, and some of these uh, they are one group, and then there are... So what would be this group's uh, conviction or stand then, under Philip Hing? Well, they are not much different from us, but because of these uh, personal backgrounds and uh, there are certain grouches against us, so they form a group, but then now they are splintered. They, they have sort of... Uh, not been happy with each other, so 
so the group is not very strong. Mm -hmm. Split it out. Then we have got another one called Charlie Tan. So he starts his independent Presbyterian church all by himself. So there are four groups. And then stray ones are not committed here, there, like that. So this, most of these students, are, these leaders are also graduates from FEPC? All of them. Right. We have ordained so many of our graduates and they become BP pastors. Practically all of them are ordained by us. Right. On what basis and where did you borrow this concept of a synod and a presbytery then? That is a normal Presbyterian practice. We are bound to develop that way according to our ecclesiology, our doctrine of church mm -hmm. formation. Right. The role of pastor, elders and deacons, how have they evolved over the years? We have evolved to include deacons in the committee of the elders. This is a tradition we received from our Chinese Life Church mm. from the beginning 1950. Our mother church, they meet pastor and elders and deacons as the highest body. According to the American system, no. It's a pastor and the elders who are the highest. That the deacons are under this group. But I have uh, adopted the style of our mother church, which included all the deacons, because I feel that the deacons sometimes are better than the elders. Because some of the old fellows, then they get a prestige because you're the old member, then you become uh, elder. But we include the, the deacons so that when we have to decide anything, we got a greater co co cohesion and better command of of the situation. Mm. What so, about the process of decision making? So that's highest meeting we have once a month. They call it the session meeting. So the session includes the deacons. This is a new development. Mm -hmm. According to the old system, it's only the pastor and the elders. But here we have the deacons, so when we meet, they've got 25 people, the highest uh, governing body. That's as far as life is concerned. When was it introduced, the deacons? From beginning, from 1950. Right. We followed that system. Right. Is there such a thing as someone having the final say in the decision making? We are the final say. So what if there are disagreements among the elders and deacons? No. We must come to a consensus. We are the highest body. So, well, you may say the highest body is still the pastor and the elders. But I don't make it like that. We will have to agree among us, including the deacons. So what if one person disagrees? With well, then you are voted out. It's, it's no use. We, we go by vote, the democratic system. Right, you... Yeah, so, so you if you have won, there's, there's no way you are outvoted, so you've got to follow the, the, the majority. Right, right. So it's using the democratic... We don't have what they call majority. Usually we work for a consensus, so everybody agreeing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the event, if there are disagreement, then we'll go for Well, the the, it, it breaks up underneath. Some will be, you know, whispering and criticizing all that. But I leave them alone because the truth is the truth. And we've got deacons like that who walk out and they are not happy. Okay, leave, leave them. But after some time they repent and come back. Like in the buying of build a house, there was a real great structure. Great structure. What about in terms of terms of office? In terms in, of the length terms, of service? In terms of office, the elders have a hierarchical prestige where they assist a pastor in baptism, in a Lord's Supper, which the deacons don't do. Is it an appointment for life, elders? No, three years per term. But if you are not serving, you are still called an elder, but 
it will be sort of retired, but you still uh, maintain the rank. Right. But you have no power. What about the terms of office for a pastor then? The pastor is the highest. So that to be a BB pastor, you have you you feel you are very honored. Mm -hmm. But in the Baptist church, the pastor is an employee, and the committee decides. The pastor has no say, and that is pretty bad. Mm. But here I have a lot of say. Mm. But provided I'm also qualified, and I say things that are relevant and not speak some nonsense, mm -hmm. so. Usually, whatever I introduce, I have uh, the full support all the way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they might hold me and I may be too enthusiastic, but on the whole, they are very, very agreeable. So, for the moment, I would say I'm very happy with my session. Mm -hmm. In terms of the election of pastor and elders and deacons, can you comment on it? Three years once. By the congregation. We must all be terminated in their office and be uh, go into the, re, uh, the re, uh, election. Mm -hmm. Usually, we will be re-elected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, the synod. Uh, was at the helm before 1988. Can you describe the roles and functions of the Synod? It had a moderator, like chairman, moderator, and all the pastors and all the elders are in the Synod. The deacons are there, but more in a subsidiary role. So then we pass certain uh, decisions. But then we have our branches that don't obey. That's how the split came. We said we had to use the King James Version, but the Mount Carmel says we like to use the NIV. You know that there's a great tussle between them. So they did not want to obey us. That is also partly the cause of the split, you see. Right. Uh, as a side, since you're talking about KJV and NIV, can I get you to comment on the new KJV? The new KJV is uh, not so bad as the NIV. And uh, we don't want to use uh, New King James because they still follow some of the NIV lines in the matter of acceptance of the text. Right. And uh, therefore, we have to drop out the the new KJV. Right. They still follow the lines of the NIV, but not as bad. Right. Because it somehow other it falls along the same line. Well, I line mean, he, it takes the side of KJV also, but you know, half half. Mm -hmm. Still not clear, see. Right. But the KJV is a one straight line. Right. Okay. Now, coming back to church structure, um, can we capture on record the evolution of the various ministries that came into the being since the inception of uh, Life BP in 1955? You're talking of Life Church or the other churches too? Let's talk about just Life Church. Well, Life Church naturally follows a direction of the pastor. So from the very, very beginning, the idea of a book shop was in my mind. So I become a call porter, that means selling Bibles, because we had no place. When we built this church, one of the corner rooms became a book room. And uh, we went on for some time, but there was no manager, so it closed. Which year were we talking about when it first started? 1962, our college was built. Mm. So we had a little room there. And Ivy was a seller of the books. She earned $40 to pay for her food. But when she graduated and married me, then no one took care of the book room. That's how the whole thing closed. Mm -hmm. But 1976, we revived it. 
So that's where the very nice house you have. Not as big, but then we expanded. So that was uh, one of the main drives of the Life Church. But because they are selling all kinds of books that clash with the doctrine, we took it back. Now it belongs to the FEBC. All right, the development of the book room is a powerful, is a very important. Now we are selling books, and there's the power of the books reaches far and wide because we have a book center ourselves. Eh? You mean in 1976 you actually farm up the place? I restarted it with my own capital, $1,000. The pastor did not want to bother the church because we were poor in those days. All things not good. Mm-hmm. So I gave a thousand dollars, and then from there we spin. You mentioned that uh, you stopped it for a while because they were um, selling some other books that were not in no, line. No, we took it back in 1995. Yeah. Who do you take it back from, Doctor? From Paul Wong. We privatized it. I think 1996, May, we took it back. Right. But the book room is a very powerful uh, this, uh, branch of the church, mm-hmm. which my other branch churches never get the vision, and uh, none of them, even Zion, they cannot do it. New Life, they cannot do it. They, they must be dry, you see. Yeah, that actually brings to a very um, uh, obvious observation, and that is um, one of the outstanding things that... Um, Life Church has done is to get itself involved in the distribution of publications to its members. Well, then, my my pen, I've written about 30 books now, and our session is very docile, willing to listen to me because our offerings are good. So every time I publish a book, they agree, take 1,000 and give free to the members. And the members, when they get it free, they also know how to offer back. Some people want to calculate, oh, I must sell them. And I get, I, no, I said, just give them freely. In that way, not only giving to the members, but we minister to a lot of outsiders. Philippines, one year, about 30 pastors will write me, and we send them one box of books worth $100 with postage. So this goes out to help them, you know, mm-hmm. is, is one, one area. And then when they distribute a lot of good pamphlets, it goes to influence the people's reading and uh, ideas and uh, doctrine also. All right, that's one. The second one was the founding of the Bible College. And this is the most powerful of all. These are life churches. Special lines, huh? Mm. I'm talking about life, life church. And the idea of the Bible college came from me as a pastor. So finally, the job of support of the college comes from the pastor. So the book room first, the Bible college, the third thing is the missions outreach. Mm-hmm which has uh, proliferated very far. The kindergarten, we founded the kindergarten as part of our service to the public. The government is well pleased with the kindergarten. If we do not have a kindergarten, government is short of one unit of teaching this below primary one. They tried to take over the kindergarten, they failed, government. They failed. Many years ago, they wanted to do the kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Finally, they left it to the the private sectors. Mm -hmm. So we have the kindergarten. You mentioned about missions earlier. Um, Can you explain how did you go about setting up the missions ministry and why was it later on proliferated? At one time, we had a sort of a common uh, thrust that the smaller churches also co- contribute. But this um, thing somehow fizzles, and each church has its own mission. Mm-hmm. 
So all the other churches, they had their own missionary outreach. That makes the work much faster. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the mission's um, drive is very strong in Life Church. That is very evident. And then comes our Ministry of Hospitality after we bought over this Beulah house. We paid $7.2 million, but now it's worth $55 million because a piece of land opposite along Newton Road, the same size they sold for $57 million. But then because of a Beulah house, we are able to house our married students. But now with a guest, and I try to help every nationality. Not only I've got Chinese, not counting our students, we've got Chinese, Filipino, Burmese, and uh, Brunei, Thai, all people staying over there. There are about 75 people staying in Beulah House now. Not necessarily your students too, right? Yeah, we well, open to outsiders for, for a good cause mm -hmm. because they need it and we've got spare rooms. And I baptize eight who come from mainland China because they stay here. Mm -hmm. So, not that you stay here, you must attend my church. No, I never make it a condition. But they come and they find the Lord and baptize eight of them. And who are these people? Are they workers? Yeah, they are all having jobs, PRs and work permits. Believers or non-believers? Well, I baptized eight of them. They, they came not believers, but now they're believers. So they're members of the church. Most of them attend the Chinese service. Ah, so that's what you meant by hospitality yeah, ministry. Yeah, so the hospitality ministry has uh, brought in baptized members. But not only that, we help them and they are very happy to have the accommodation free. We never charge them. Never charge them. If they want to leave behind your offering, we accept it. But we give them the non, uh, no condition. We take, take care of them. Wouldn't that be a long waiting list to actually come in well, and Well, in and out, they all come like uh, members in Indonesia. They come from Batam, from Tanjung Pinang. And they know where to find a place. They just walk in and put them up. <laughs> mm. And they go home very happy. Sometimes they leave behind the offering, sometimes they don't. It's all right, we take care, take care of them. But for non-believing um, um, hostelites, what would be some of the criteria for taking them in? When they are recommended by a member, and this person is a non-Christian, well, I quote the Psalm 84, that sparrows and swallows find a nest in the house. But sparrows and swallows are unclean birds. Only the pigeon and the dove, they are clean birds, they can be offered, but sparrows and swallows are unclean. So quoting this, I take them in now right. and try to help them. And many of them are very grateful, short-term policy, you know. They have nowhere to go, up and stay two or three months and they go on their way. Mm -hmm. As a matter of interest, um, Revento, how much time do you spend um, reaching out to non-believers, even as pastor today? I don't uh, do very much now. It's impossible. You have the church administration, two churches, mm -hmm. all the weddings practically on me. They don't want to go to other. They want me to marry them. So this is, takes time. Mm -hmm. Funerals. Those who are seriously sick in the hospital, you must go and visit them. But sometimes we go there and then we have a non-Christian and after preaching to them, they believe and we baptize them, then we gain, that is from the non-believers. Mm -hmm. But my church work and teaching will not give me a special time to say I go out to evangelize the unbelievers, except on a mission trip like going to Bengkalis, we're going to establish a church there. So I say, well, you people go the first trip, I'll go the second trip. 
and going to Bukit Batu. They had the first trip. I made the second trip. I, I'm more like a figurehead. Mm. With uh, so much um, members wanting attention from their beloved pastor, how do you juggle your time? That is why I've got my pastoral chat every week. This weekly is my lifeline. It's a very important paper. So they read what I tell them, things happening in the church, these are of great interest to them. Mm -hmm. And that's how we keep in touch. It's impossible, about 100 and 1,600 members. I'm like a father who met his son, and he had 30 sons. So he asked the young son, you look very familiar to him, very handsome, who is your father? And then he discovered that was his son, but neither the son nor the father. <laughs> It's a true story. So it's a hard time for me to know everyone. I tried myself to know everyone, such as going on the trip to the Holy Land that I know. Many of these I don't know. They come in, I know them. And through the prayer meeting, through the Bible camp, and through the especially coming to see me. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have uh, stopped at the hospitality ministry. Are there any other significant ministries? Yes, uh, as I say, the running of the Life Church Weekly is a, is a pattern for all the other BP churches. Every church now runs a weekly paper like Life Church, but we are the one who set the example. And You're the, talking about the bulletin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah our, right. our weekly paper. Yes, yes. It's very informative. Ours is very small, only one sheet. Some people like to make two sheets, three sheets. Mm -hmm. and advertise Nasi Loma is today's a makan. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but I put in the most important. Yeah, I think many people have been encouraged by your bulletin because um, it is informative. It tells a um, visitor or a member what's happening in the church. And it gives the impression that it's a very mission-minded church. And it also has a lot of uh, theological points mm -hmm. on this or that. We touch on them, you see. Right. What about the other ministries such as the Sunday School, the Adult Fellowship, the Women's Fellowship? How did this come about? Well, this is very interesting. We have a tradition of a good Sunday School. And especially we have a big adult Sunday school. And then we have uh, this uh, children's ministry to reach down to the youngest, which is uh, stressed by Deacon Ong Eng Lam. I must give him the credit for that. And because our church is uh, founded on this very uh, free principle of decentralization. We believe in decentralization. So our church has got the most fellowship groups. If you count them, there may be about 16 of them. Mm -hmm. One of them is my wife. We came back from America after teaching there one year, 1979, and she felt called to start a children's choir. Now the children's choir has got 60 members, and they have their own children's worship and practice of hymns and so forth. And it's a very uh, much sought after um, institution by the, by the godly parents. They all want to put their little ones to join Ivy's group in the children's choir. So she has developed that sort of expertise. Mm -hmm. So the children's choir, I think you know, they sing once a month or something mm -hmm. like that. One. And uh, that has given rise to the junior worship choir. They also like to more or less follow. Then, it's very interestingly, we have the basic was the YF. That was in the beginning, apart from Sunday school and the YF, then the YF developed in the YAF. Mm. Because of the age differential. 